What makes a fighting game stage great can be extremely subjective because then you gotta ask yourself the question, what makes a stage interesting to you? Is it about having references and cameos? Is it about like historical context? Or maybe something that's kind of fitting in both tone and atmosphere? Or honestly, maybe it's just nostalgia. Or maybe it's none of that because it's about the function of the stage and not the aesthetics because the aesthetics can kind of just get in the way of that. Regardless of your answer, I'm here today to talk about some of our favorite fighting game stages. And I've asked some lovely members of the FGC who I can't thank enough for their time today to help me answer that question. I'm gonna leave links to their socials in the description below, so please go give every one of these people a follow. With that, I hope you enjoy. Hey everyone, I'm Seven Force. And when I think of my favorite kinds of fighting game stages, they tend to be the ones that either evolve as a match plays out or change significantly between rounds. There's a few in that vein that I really like, but my all-time favorite is Geese Howard's stage in Fatal Fury 3. So yeah, the top of Geese Tower is a backdrop in a fair amount of fighting games, but the Fatal Fury 3 version felt like something out of a movie the first time I saw it. So the first round starts, and it's like a more extravagant version of his Fatal Fury special stage. So you've got the Buddha statue in the background with the little bonsai plants and makeshift ponds on the sides. But of course, Geese is from good old US of A, so he has a flag in the background reminding you if you forgot. Depending on the match circumstances, sometimes you'll get the regular version of the stage that transitions to evening and then nighttime. But my absolute favorite version of the stage triggers only if you're playing as Andy, Terry, or Joe. So if you go into round 2 with any of them versus Geese, the background catches fire and the song goes from only kinda sounding like Geese's theme to being a full blown new arrangement. And I think this version being so dramatic pairs really well with the fiery background here. But then, if it goes to round 3, the fire in the background grows into this towering, all consuming wall of flame, and it starts burning things in the background too. It feels like the fighting game equivalent to the climax of like, I don't know, a really intense action movie. Geese isn't even the final boss in this game, that would be the twins, but his arcade mode fight is way more memorable in comparison. This isn't exactly the stage that made me start paying attention to the little details in fighting game stages, that'd be Ken's Alpha 2 stage, but it's the one that convinced me that designing a good fighting game stage is kind of an art form unto itself, and I just really find that indescribably cool. And I mean, fighting games are cool, right? I'd like to think that's why we all play them in the first place. Hey, I'm Rome himself, and first and foremost, shoutouts to Babe Ruthless. Now, when I was tasked with finding a stage for this video, my mind immediately started racing. And just like that, it hit me like an electrical wall fire. Or should I say Shoryuken? That's right, I decided to go with the stage from my favorite fighting game of all time, Street Fighter Alpha 2, and that stage in question is obviously Ken's stage. Ken's stage is simply phenomenal to look at from a surface level. But let's take a deeper look. As you can see, it's a birthday party put together on a yacht for Ken's then-girlfriend, Eliza. And boy, did he go all the way out from the gracious golden and red color scheme to the parallax scrolling of the sultry night sky, creating a beautiful eye paradise. The brass of the horns giving you audio satisfaction. And of course, you cannot forget the large amount of cameos that encompasses the entire stage. Ken invited so many of Capcom's 90s darlings to this party. And man, it really, really makes me want to immerse myself in it. I could be there side betting with Captain Commando and Ninja Commando on who's gonna win the fight. I could cool down with the late night swim with Lynn, Felicia, and Purr at the pool. I could even make fun of Strider standing there by himself holding that teddy bear for whatever reason. There's just so many cool things happening in this one stage and it immediately takes me back to when I was a kid playing Alpha 2 on my dad's Saturn and just gives me the full Capcom experience. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to go buy a drink for that beautiful girl with the green hair. She looking kind of nice and I'm feeling kind of lucky, but thanks again for having me, BR. Hey everyone, it's me, Aaron, or you, whatever the hell you want to call me. So, favorite stage. Uh, this is one of those questions that I've been asked a lot and for the longest time I didn't have an answer to it. Whenever someone asked me, I would always just say one of the stages from Darkstalkers 3 because yeah, I remember those being really good. I remember the train stage, I remember Fius of God, I remember the stage where you're on the side of a building. Those are all really good, but none of them felt like the right answer. It was just the answer I could come up with. And then last year, when we were doing the Street Fighter retrospective, and we got to the Alpha games, 
and I was playing back through Alpha 2. I got to Ken's stage, and something in the back of my mind just unlocked. Like a memory of a stage that I had completely forgotten about. It all came rushing back to me, and... How did I describe that stage in the video again? Good lord, this stage? Good lord, this stage. Yeah, I'd say that pretty much sums up how I feel. This stage is amazing. I love the idea of all these characters just being there in the background of this stage, and let me just say, SNK did this a lot too, where they would have the other characters from their other games just hanging out in the background of King of Fire stages, but I didn't really get into SNK games until just a couple of years ago, so I didn't have that nostalgia for any of these stages. But with this stage, I remember playing this in the arcade as a kid, and just going like, wait a minute, I think that's some Darkstalkers in there. Oh, is that Strider hear you? Oh yeah, look at all those characters back there. But now that I'm older and I realize, oh no, it just wasn't those handful of characters. It's all of them. I know all of these characters now. But they also went that extra step. It's not just nostalgia of being able to say, oh, I recognize that thing. No, it's being able to look at them and they actually like created a setting for this. They came in here and they said, all right, Ken is throwing a party for Eliza and he invited everyone to come along. So everyone in the background is somebody there to attend Eliza's birthday party. So we're getting all these other Capcom characters to come there for that. All right, that's cute. That's charming. You got Strider here, you hold a teddy bear as a gift. All right, that's nice. Oh, and you got some of the Saturday Night Slam Master guys there in tuxedos. But one of the things that makes this stage so incredible to me is that they also essentially just said, okay, these aren't just characters crossing over. They're the Street Fighter versions of those characters because you have Darkstalker characters in there. But Darkstalkers are monsters. Monsters don't exist within Street Fighter. So they went the extra step. They didn't just use some old sprites that they had laying around. They actually went the extra step and they created human versions of these Darkstalkers. And that's something that you still see that in Street Fighter to this day. In Street Fighter 6, whenever you get a shot of money in that game, it's money with Dr. Light on there. And they're kind of implying that Dr. Light's either the president or he was a president in the past at some point in time. And that's something that I really love about, it's a very small thing about Capcom, but something that I love about them is the way that they put their Easter eggs into their games is that they don't just come in here and they say, oh, it's that thing. They come in here and they essentially just create a version of their other characters that can exist within their universe. And that's such a unique way to do crossovers and it's got so much imagination behind it. And like I said, when I was a kid, I loved that stage because I love seeing those characters back there. But now as an adult, I love seeing just the creativity that went into the way that they did that crossover. And big crossover stages that bring in all these other characters, they're really special because yeah, you do enjoy seeing not just characters that you recognize, but you enjoy seeing them all hang out. You enjoy seeing these characters interacting with other characters, even if it's just like a small thing, just like a small thing of like two characters staying next to each other, just pretending to talk in the background. It's a fun thing. If you enjoy these characters, you enjoy seeing those little tiny bits that they give you. But we don't really get stuff like that anymore. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that video games these days take so long to make, so you can't come in here and create fully detailed models of existing characters just so they can stand in the background. We don't have time to do that anymore. Or it could possibly be that because now every fine game is a live service and they don't know what's going to pop up in year four of that game when they're making year one, I have a weird feeling like it might also be someone stepping in and saying, nah, you can't put that character in the background. No, 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 no. We might end up adding them later to this game. That's why, you know, as I said, King of Fighters used to be, no pun intended, the king of this. They used to have some of the best crossover stages, but now King of Fighters 15, it's like, oh yeah, I think that's that boxer from Fatal Fury who's never been in anything else, including the other Fatal Furies. Yeah. That's what you get for your crossover background characters now. So seeing a stage like this, where it's not just a bunch of characters that I have all this nostalgia for, and a bunch of characters that really speak to that era of Capcom that I remember loving so much, but also the fact that they went that extra step and they're all at a party and they're all there to give gifts and they're all mingling with each other and they're all interacting with each other and there's different versions that exist within the Street Fighter universe all there in that background. 
That's what makes that stage so unique, and it easily has to be my favorite fighting game stage. Hey guys, I'm Haseo, and today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite fighting stage. So I decided that it would be Domo Di Sirio from Tekken 7. Okay, but why I like this stage? Honestly, I think Tekken is one of the fighting games that has one of the most like complete and elaborate stage in fighting games. So the first time I saw Domo Di Sirio, I was like really surprised because actually it was like my first Tekken that I tried to compete. So when I wanted to train, I went to practice, I went to do something, I always went to that stage. One of the most important reasons is that I think it's Claudius. It's Claudius' stage. This cathedral has a lot of details everywhere. It's crazy. I don't know if, if actually it was optimal, like, you know, if you wanted to play online, but it was always beautiful to, to watch it, for me at least. And of course, it represents Claudio. Claudio is my main uh, in Tekken, now in Tekken 8 2. So, with the music, uh, all the elements in the stage, it was like, wow, mind blown, actually. I like the colors, like the vitrals on the back. The statues, like, oh, oh my god, like, I feel I can be in that stage. And actually, the first part, because you can, you can fell off the stage to another part, like, it's kind of a thing in Tekken. The first part is, like, not too big, not too small, so I feel really comfortable playing in, in that part. And... If you want to practice, you want to learn what do I do if I can't make someone fall down from the stage and now it's the time to practice in that part too, actually. So, the music, the music is like so dramatic. I really like that theme and um, I think it's called like the stage, Domo Di Sirio. It has two parts, like for the final round and everything and it's, it's perfect. So. Guys, if you're looking like, okay, I want to see a stage that is actually really beautiful, like all the visuals, you have to watch Domo Di Sirio. Thank you so much, guys. See you. Picking a favorite fighting game stage is no easy task, especially for someone like me who, when prompted to name my favorite thing of any category, will have a switch flip in my brain that removes literally any item of that category from my memory. So instead, I decided to base my submission around aesthetic themes I like. And today I wanted to talk about liminal spaces in fighting games, and I ain't talking about the back rooms. I'm of course referring to the more contemporary kind. Liminal spaces are something you would think fighting games would make more use of, but many games don't quite commit to it. There are games like Mortal Kombat 3 and Tekken 2 which sort of invoke that vibe, but never in a way that feels like an intentional part of the aesthetic, it's more like a, a wet-dry world effect. To me, no game goes all in on it quite like Undernight and Birth, and with that said, I wanted to talk about Kido Heights stage, Metropolitan Center Intersection. This stage takes place at an office district and consists of strong blue hues as well as a nice purple-red coat of paint in the sequel, and the background is adorned with what appears to be the many business buildings of Kanzakai, the fictional developing city in which the game's story is set. The fight takes place on the sidewalk and in the background you can see other sidewalks, forged with bushes and trees, a monument with a clock on top of it showing that it's a little past 1am, and a lone street light showing red further down the intersection, which is very curious to me because it's weird to have a red light when there's no cars and nobody's crossing the streets, but hold on to that concern because we will come back to it. This is the more contemporary kind of liminal space that I've always felt the genre was lacking. These spaces always have such intrigue and they're so mysterious. 
feeling isolated in open spaces is a hard vibe to get right and not only is this stage a great example of that, but the entire catalogue of Undernight and Birth stages is. Anyway, one of the most important reasons that I picked this stage over others besides just liking how it looks is the note made by designer Seichi Yoshihara, wherein he states that the reason the streets are so empty is because when the cast unleashes exist, their, their power, their existence fuses with the voids and they become unable to recognise anybody around them. I'm not sure how this explains the absence of cars, especially since another stage in this game has many cars in it, but I think it's just a flareover function type of case. I mean, come on, empty desolate streets are cool. What makes this stage especially fascinating to me over the others in this game is that this was also the stage Yoshihara made to symbolise the world of the game, the stage made to set the tone, and also the very first stage that was actually sketched for the game. Getting a slam dunk like this on your first go is kind of unprecedented. I would know. I wrote the script for this segment countless times, and this is my third, maybe fourth recording. Yeah, the suffering is constant and never ending. I've been Chaos, thank you for listening. Choosing a favourite fighting game stage out of the thousands out there isn't an easy choice, but there are a few key factors that mean a lot to me. I really like stages that successfully capture a specific period or era. For example, I think the Capcom vs SNK games do a great job at capturing something very millennial, which is the whole point behind this series anyway. From the music to the gritty but colourful backdrops, there's something just so Y2K about everything here and I love it. I especially like the completely insane beer-chugging robot cowboy in CVS2 because why the hell not? SNK in general are great at this. The Edo period, for example, is captured so evocatively in the Last Blade series. But if I had to choose one specific stage, the ultimate synthesis of music, backdrop, mood, tone, ambience, everything, it's actually from, surprise surprise, a Tekken game. Tekken has so many cool backgrounds, it's hard to choose, from the vibrant streets of Shinjuku to the recent descent into subconscious, which is just so innovative. Okay, it's Moonlit Wilderness. Of course, Moonlit Wilderness. What else could it be? Moonlit Wilderness. It's almost cliche at this point to even mention this, but this is an absolute masterclass of a background. From concept to execution, this nails it in every department conceivable. The music is so sweeping and dramatic that it's almost inevitable that it became the backdrop to about a million Mugen videos. I love how this stage captures and magnifies the beauty of a fight between two martial arts masters. This is a lonely stage, they're not out here to prove anything to anyone except themselves and the moon. It's almost like something from a romance novel, except with more wave dashing and electrics. There's a whole video on this channel dedicated to just how amazing Moonlit Wilderness is, and I highly recommend you watch it. Thanks so much to Babe Ruthless for inviting me to participate in this video. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hi, my name's Wooly, and my favorite fighting game stage of all time is easily Moonlit Wilderness from Tekken 5. I mean, I feel that I'm someone who loves, I love a good fighting game stage. There's so much personality to them. There's a lot of the times there's stages that can get pretty cluttered with details ultimately, but it's such a charming thing when you go back and you look at some of the amazing work we've seen in uh, sprite work over the years in, in different fighting games. You know, a lot of SNK games in particular uh, have some really gorgeous sprawling views. And um, lo again, lots of detail uh, tends to be crammed in with a lot of personality. but. The stark contrast, I feel, of like Moonlit Wilderness is just, it's an empty field, but it's a beautiful, beautiful scene. It is a postcard-esque field of flowers that you fight in. And, you know, again, the contrast of that kind of beauty with the violence of the fighters on top of it, of course, is not lost. Um, it's broken up by, you know, just an incredible, like, like abandoned castle in the background as well. And the lighting that hits, you know, on the fighters as well just kind of creates a whole ambiance that is unmatched. It blew my mind when I saw it. Not to mention, of course, the, the bombastic swelling music, the vocals that kick in. You know, such a good track that is just memorable forever. 
I mean, it, it's no, you know, surprise that they referenced it again in Tekken Tag 2 by, you know, kind of remixing the stage a little bit. But yeah, that original is just the best thing. Uh, I mean, you know, if, if you want to uh, harken back to some of these kind of open field settings as well, like there's, um, it's, there's a vibe to it that is like, this could be easily the final boss of a FromSoft game. I mean, Sekiro kind of has that going for it. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 3, the same idea as well. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Street Fighter 2, the uh, animated movie, Sagat and Ryu fight in that empty field. And then again, that's referenced in Street Fighter Alpha and again in 5, because it's just such a cool, simple thing, you know? I feel that, like, yeah, it, I, I like being a big stage with lots going on. I like a lot of personality, but something like Moonlit Wilderness just breaks that up a little bit, you know, creates a, a just a, a, a beautiful contrast of violence and fighting <laughs> on top of flowers in a field and uh yeah i just it feels like the creative peak of everything that team was making at that time moolah wilderness all the way so my favorite stage in fighting games i have to give this one a lot of thought oh my god a dog is attacking me um <laughs> but um i think it's link shall use um Tekken 3 stage because I played that. It was like my first Tekken game. I played that when I was a toddler and uh, you know it was kind of difficult for me to finish the game and the first time I saw Ling Xiao Yu's ending, you know, her getting a Dean Park and then you know hey has she like uh, kind of like trying to ruin her dreams instead of like it was just so mind-blowing for me I, I felt like that was a key moment for me to fall in love with fighting games and to fall in love with Tekken and I, I felt like that was the moment I knew I wanted to to keep doing this forever like gaming was a lifetime deal for me so Link Show You stage definitely means a lot for me yo it's the King King J today I want to talk about my favorite most memorable stage in fighting games it is the shinjuku stage from tekken 4. now i know people are gonna be like but jay you played you must have played capcom vs sk2 you must have played street fighter first strike and these stuff i understand but with tekken i feel like they have a lot of these kind of like fairy tale type of like stages where you know some of them are just clearly not realistic if you look at tekken 8 they're fighting in the stratosphere like how are they even able to breathe in tekken 7 they're fighting on lava they had some of them some of the characters have bare feet their, their feet is on lava so it's kind of like it it's unrealistic so i like the tekken 4 stage because some of them were uneven surfaces on the floor i know the combos were a bit more difficult in tekken 4 but for me personally i really like the sinjuku stage because of the fact of that it felt realistic you know most of the time when people have fights it's in the street and we don't have a game that has in the street type of stage it's apart from Tekken 3 which is Paul Phoenix stage which I absolutely love and adore but I don't want to go too much into that you know with the graffiti where it's a soul edge and it's got oh bro listen I love all stages but the Sinjuku one to me stand out the most because it felt realistic yeah um, if people have fight or argument in the street it, it felt like that and it just recaptured what it's like to be in Tokyo Japan where if someone is going to fight it's in the street there was some type of easter eggs as well in there and i like the bgm as well it's called a bit crusher i don't know why the song is called bit crusher but yeah that is the name of the track and yeah i like it you can go into the telephone box as well actually no you can't go in the telephone box you can go to the telephone box and combo them and then break the telephone box and then you can hear sirens and stuff like that it felt it feels like it's a busy street just by the sound of the song as well yeah, I really, really like it. Flashing lights. It's it's very colorful stage. So, yeah, I wish they start bringing more real, real stages back in Tekken. I feel like there are there aren't that many real stages anymore, and that one to me just yeah felt real good, man. I also want to add there are a few people that are standing in the street. They're kind of rooting for you to win. That stuff is pretty cool and there was again like some stuff where when the round ends you'll hear the sound of the horn and stuff like that as well like that stage was real good but we have the urban stage where leroy's stage is there and you know his statue is in the stage like we have stages like that but this was in the street though this was like 
there's a telephone box there's just a pathway a walk pathway and then you've just got bear shops whereas I feel like the, I don't remember the name on the Tekken 8 stage, but uh, it's called Urban Something. That stage is cool, but it's in a square box. It's kind of like, oh, okay. It's kind of blocked off. This is like in a walkway. It just looks so cool. So yeah, that's one of my favorite stages. I know people are going to be like, what? Like, but yeah, I like real, I like realistic stages where it kind of feels like it's a real fight going on rather than these kind of crazy stages where we're fighting in on planet earth at the end of planet earth or something like that or we're fighting in space i don't really like stages like that but stages that feel realistic where you know if you do go to shopping and you do see a fight it's happening in a street or a mall it's you know it felt realistic and i feel like tekken 4 had some of the most the best stages in my opinion in tekken history so yeah that's my thoughts on my my most favorite stage Na, 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 na. Huh? What's your favorite fighting game stage? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, what is my favorite fighting game stage? Come on, let's take a look. I mean, there's classics like what? What the fuck are you doing here? As I was saying, there's classics like uh, Tekken 4 Rooftop. Banging theme in this puppy, by the way. MK9's The Pit with the fatty stage fatality. You know what I'm talking about. MVC2 Carnival. We just got a real match. Anyone? Anyone? Quintessential bangers, a lot of them. But they aren't my favorites. No, that title goes to Ryu Stage from Street Fighter Alpha 3. The Road. I mean... Look at it, it's like a visual marvel. But it doesn't just look cool. Unlike Ryu stage in Alpha 2, which is set in this like pristine snowy night time with a calming color palette and this swelling heroic music, the road is instead this arid wasteland that is almost bereft of any life. Susaku Castle in the background, you know, homeboy's place, seems almost impossibly distant in the backdrop. And the theme is punchy and super chaotic. A pretty good visual representation of Ryu's internal struggle with his darker side, wouldn't you say? All in all, pretty evocative stuff. Though, to be honest, none of these reasons are why I like the road so much. You see, when I was getting into fighting games, some 15 or so years ago, oh god, I used to obsess about watching Japanese match videos. And a couple of them, featuring Big Dog himself, Daigo, etched themselves into the core of my memory. The quality on these old uploads are so poor, it is hard to make out anything but like vague shapes. Which means my memory of the road actually looks like this. I'll leave you with the wise words of Shad Kroger. Look at this photograph. Every time I do, it makes me laugh. Every time I do, it makes me. Hey YouTube, Diphone here, and today I want to cheat a little bit because I'm I'm going to keep it real. I'm not much of a stage person. Usually when I pick a stage in a fighting game, I'm picking random select or I'm picking whatever stage doesn't give me motion sickness, you know, like Street Fighter V Rashid stage. But there are some instances where I purposely go out of my way to pick a stage. And so one example of that is Bond Wonderland. Now Bond Wonderland is from Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and Bond Wonderland refers to Tron Bond from the Mega Man Legends series. So I'm a huge fan of the Mega Man Legends series. I've probably played Mega Man Legends 1, Mega Man Legends 2 multiple times. And I still have hope in my heart that they'll release Mega Man Legends 3. But the real reason that I always picked that stage was all the other stages in that game sucked. <laughs> they were all super dark, it was really hard to see characters, and if the opponent happened to pick a dark skin or a dark costume on a dark stage, it was really, really hard to see them. And, you know, being able to see and being able to play my best is about one of the most important, especially for our Marvel where you get touched once and you basically die. Now, there's a few other stages that kind of come to mind and they all revolve around the music. 
and a lot of you know modern fighting games like Ram Blue or Guilty Gear kind of have the music tied to the character, so it doesn't really matter what stage you pick. But for some games like Tekken, it actually does matter. There are stage-specific themes that um, get chosen when you actually pick the stage. And the first one I can think of is Infinite Azure. You know, that's the background behind me. I think. Well, I know some people don't like the stage because, you know, infinites, they can just run away all the time. But the music combination plus, like, just the whole aesthetic of Infinite Zero really appeals to me. It kind of gives me, like, that feeling of serenity. But also, I just really, really like the music. And same thing with Tekken 8. Um, I think there's a lot of good stage themes in Tekken 8. But my favorite is probably Ortiz Farm. That's Azusana stage. And I like it for a few reasons. One, I like the whole stages that have multiple different levels. And there's a, it gives a, like a whole variety and strategy to the actual stage that you pick. Um, but also, the music is just too good. <laughs> I would literally listen to it on repeat at the gym or something like that. And you know, getting that music power up. Music, music to me is really important in fighting games because it kind of just sets the tone, it sets the expectation for the match. It kind of gets you hyped up or gets you in the mood to play and being able to pick the stage that has the right music, you know, honestly is a, is a buff to me. So those are my favorite stages. Appreciate um, you having me on and let me know down in the comments what you guys think. Hey y'all, me BB here and I want to talk to you about my favorite fighting game stage. Um, from one of my favorite fighting games ever. And that's called The Last Blade 2. Uh, Last Blade 2 is an SNK fighting game, and it is it kind of came out when they were at their best. The original SNK, um, I think this came out in 2000, if I remember, and it's just a phenomenal game. It's beautiful. It's, it plays great. It's so fun. Uh, the stage name is called Fire at the Wanamoya, uh, and it is a simple concept. It is you and your opponent trapped inside of a burning building in a fight to the death. And it has that energy. The energy is brought. It's brought so well. Um, first of all, it looks incredible. And what they did with the 2D artwork for this, this stage, this background, uh, is this is like amazing. I remember this is like the year 2000, maybe 1999. Uh, what they did with that at that time is just incredible. Let me just look at it. Uh, some of the visual touches I think are really great too. Um, like the embers that fly out of the ground when your character jumps or moves fast like the wavy filter that's put on the background to show how hot it is in the burning um in the burning building obviously it's super hot but what first stood out to me and kind of it, it, most interestingly enough is what it was missing uh, and that the stage has no stage music there's just the sounds of the burning building you'll hear the, the fire roaring, you hear the, the building falling, the parts of the building falling every once in a while. There's like an alarm bell off in the distance that you can hear. It's kind of haunting, kind of like scary. Like it's, it's when you have something like playing game music, which is so ingrained to always be there, and you just take that away, it doesn't feel right. Um, and that kind of adds to the tension of the, of the fight, I think, in such an interesting way. Um, and just the sound effects, you can't really escape. The burning building that's all you hear that's all you could focus on the fire is raging around you and you have to kill this other samurai on the other side it's so dramatic this game is, is super melodramatic in a lot of different ways and i love it for that uh and the stage is like the peak moment of this game uh in terms of its art and direction i think so yeah fire at watermoya um and last way too incredible game incredible stage Something that you should be playing if you haven't played it. It's well worth playing. And uh, this game is full of beautiful stages, beautiful sprites, beautiful animations. Um, like I said, peak SNK at their best. So, Hello everyone, my name is Jesse from the channel Jesse's Auditorium. Thank you very much to Babe Ruthless for letting me be a part of this video. But speaking of Babe Ruthless, I actually found her channel when YouTube recommended me the video for Moonlit Wilderness. And speaking of Moonlit Wilderness, we're going to talk about my favorite stage, which is from Tekken 5, and that is, it's not Moonlit Wilderness, but it's Waterfall, or the variant of Meteor Shower, so it's, a, it's kind of a two-for-one, sorry I cheated. But that's kind of one of the reasons I, uh, I've always admired the stage, it has two variants, I kind of miss variants of stages like that. And I really just love everything about it when it comes to the nature, the waterfall, the trees. It's very lively. It kind of looks like it's one of those places that have been untouched by human civilization. And the birds are around. And then, of course, 
at nighttime, it just changes into a whole new vibe for uh, what was it, Dark Resurrection. Uh, I can't really go without saying that the soundtrack, of course, um, if anyone knows me, is one of the biggest reasons of to go along with the stage. We have Formless Like Water, which is a, um, a nod to Bruce Lee, and then Estrada de Estrella, which is Star Road. It's just honestly kind of one of these stages that I feel could work in any fighting game, if that makes any sense. Like, I would love to see it as a background in MK or, you know, Guilty Gear, whatever. It's just a really nice uh, visual. And one more thing that I should say that might be kind of surprising is I don't really have that much experience with stage because I never played a Tekken 5. Uh, I came in during Tag 2 and then played a little bit of seven. So six and below were before my time. So my only experience with these stages is just watching footage, old tournament footage, and just kind of, you know, seeing it here and there, but, and then the song, hearing it in playlists, but I've never actually myself set foot in this stage. And yet it is still my favorite. That's how lovely it is. So my favorite is waterfall slash media shower. Hey, what's going on guys? This is Tabmock99. Now today I've been asked to talk to you about one stage from any fighting game. So of course, I picked Mortal Kombat. And the stage that I've chosen is the Warrior Shrine, sometimes referred to as the Hall of Warriors. First seen in the original Mortal Kombat game, the idea behind this one was pretty creepy. Imagine that Shang Tsung lures the best fighters in Earthrealm to his private island for a tournament. And by the time they arrive, they discover full-size, realistic statues of themselves already waiting for them. And you can tell that these statues have been crumbling for quite some time, so they were obviously constructed years beforehand. It's as if Shang Tsung could see the future and knew well in advance exactly who would be showing up. It also gives the player a sneak preview of the game's sub-boss, Prince Goro, featured front and center. Now here's a fun fact. In the Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive version, they didn't have enough room on the cartridge to give everyone their own statue, so they had to cut one out. The guy they cut? Liu Kang. Instead, they just reused the ninja statue a second time. Just think about it. They cut the character who would actually go on to become the champion of the game. Speaking of champion, in the attract mode for Mortal Kombat 2, this stage was depicted as the setting for the final battle between Liu Kang and Shang Tsung. Yep, that's canon. But other than that, it would be a long time before we saw this stage again. It would be 13 years with the release of Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks. Here, it's no longer presented as part of Shang Tsung's island, but rather adjacent to the Wuxi Academy, so it hits a lot different. In this reimagining of the game, it's as though the forces of light quickly erected this shrine as a way of honoring those warriors who fought to save Earthrealm. Of course, this stage was also the backdrop for an amazing hidden fight, probably my favorite fight in the whole game. Now, as you can see, it's possible to interact with all the different statues and get a custom message for each one. So it's clear who all the other statues are for, but who's this one supposed to be? Scorpion or Sub-Zero? Turns out, neither. It's the long-rumored Red Ninja, Ermac. Wow, what a way to take a long-standing popular rumor from the arcade era and turn it into... Reality. Well, another 14 years would go by, but we'd eventually see this arena return again in Mortal Kombat 11. You can see it here in the Crypt mode, where it's once again presented as part of Shang Tsung's island which by this point in the series is in utter ruins. The statues are still standing though, and there's even a small side mission where you have to find the Earthrealm Protector Amulet and place it inside the Raiden statue. And that's not all. You can also see it in the game's story mode when Jax and Jackie first arrive on the island. It's presented a bit differently here as you can see that there's now statues on both sides of them as they pull up. So this stage has always been awesome to me. Regardless of the changes they've made over the years and the implications that that has on the lore, you don't see this stage that often, but when you do, it's always a treat. So I'd really like to thank Babe Ruthless for having me be part of this video. Until next time, this is Tadmok99. And who knows, maybe they'll make a statue of me one day. Hello, I'm Melina, and I'm here to talk about my all-time favorite fighting game stage. Um, my pick is not going to be a surprise to those that know me. And I'm going to go with Mortal Kombat Deadpool. The reason why I choose this stage is because it brings back so much memories to me to when I was a kid and I used to play that game nonstop, which I shouldn't have been playing it, 
but yeah that is one of my favorite stages i love the bold colors i'm a sucker for bold colors the gore and the most important part that you can actually uppercut your opponents into a pool full of acid <laughs> i'm like who doesn't want to do that <laughs> but yeah that is my favorite fighting game stage of all time it's a super classic one and you can't go wrong with that one so yeah thank you so much for watching I think when it comes to fighting game stages, the one that always sticks out in my head the most is gonna be the Fetus of God from Darkstalkers 3. Uh, you know, I'm a big Darkstalkers fan, a lot of people are, but I think what sticks to me the most about that stage is just how grotesque and surprising it is. Because, you know, a lot of Darkstalkers, the appeal is sort of the, 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 the cartoony violence. You know, we have these monster movie tropes. Um, it's not really, and there is like, you know, some body horror, but it's not like explicit to where it's like hard to look at. But then you get to Jetta, and you see this giant baby in the background, and his eyes open. And you're like, what the hell just happened? Like, I, it, it is shocking. I, I genuinely think that's like, there are very few fighting game stages where you like, you look at them and you're like, whoa, like, what's going on? Like, I, this is horrific, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of stages that are like, oh, this is so cool, or this is very memorable because there's a lot of cool stuff happening in the background, but this one, you're just like, taking aback, like, how is this real? How is this a real stage that I'm looking at right now? Folks, I wanted to talk about my favorite stage in fighting games. This was really hard to come up with a pick here, but in the end, I think I want to go with the Clock Tower stage from Marvel vs. Capcom 2. There's a lot that I like about this. Obviously, the music is amazing. I think probably top three tracks in Marvel 2. The aesthetic, I think, is really beautiful as well. I love bright stages where it's easy to see everything. It also makes for really good YouTube thumbnails because it stands out so well. And there's a little Easter egg that uh, some of you people who didn't play this game back in the day might not know, which is that the clock really works. Uh, whatever time your Dreamcast was set to, the system time, is what time it would be on the clock. And I think this even worked on the PS3 and 360 port. Look, I'll prove it to you. You can tell this is PS4 because it's ultra widescreen. 12, 12.48 on the in-game timer, 12.48 on the clock, which is pretty cool. So you can always impress people with that fun fact. Be like, hey, look at what time it is in-game, and, and, and it's the real time in real life. So I just think that's cool. It's also, it, it has a destructible element. So this turret over here, if you hit it with certain supers to kill a character, it will actually break. This is the only stage in the game that is like destructible as far as I know. So it's super random and surprising that of all stages, the clock tower just happens to be the one with a destructible environment. So uh, yeah, overall, I love the aesthetic. I love the music. I love the little Easter eggs. And uh, I love Marvel vs. Capcom too, so uh, yeah, that has got to be my pick. In traditional 2D fighters, stages are typically just cosmetic. Rarely do they have much impact on the gameplay itself. There are certainly some examples of this being the case. You've got the modern Mortal Kombat titles with their interactables, games like Real Bout Fatal Fury with breakable walls and ring outs. But I think one of the most interesting examples of a mechanically unique stage is found in Marvel Super Heroes and it's specifically Shuma Gorath stage. This is an infinite stage, meaning if you keep walking to the side, you will not hit a wall and the background will loop. It's a mechanic slightly more common in 3D games, namely Tekken, but in 2D fighters there aren't too many examples of it. One that comes to mind though is Galaxy Fight, which is a game entirely designed around infinite stages. It's an interesting concept because ultimately most characters benefit massively from putting you in the corner. It will give you extended combos or at very least limit the opponent's movement allowing for better mix-ups and pressure. To remove corners is to take away this advantage and that's not an easy thing to balance on any level. A very basic, key concept of competitive fighting games is punishing an opponent for moving backwards, and the safest way to do this is to just move forwards. Them giving up stage presence should be something that you as a player can benefit from in the long run, but if you're on an infinite stage, you can't really do that. Instead, you have to trap them or make some riskier play to get in. 
Ultimately, this massively benefits defensive characters because it skews the risk reward on your movement option. So I don't entirely think it works here, but it does do a good job of showing us that stages and specifically their length could be used as a balancing technique by developers. The problem is you end up being tasked with punishing too much backwards movement, which to be fair, Guilty Gear already does with its negative penalty. Another balancing technique you could employ is giving characters the ability to create faux corners, like Crusader in DNF Duel with that gigantic shield wall, or even give characters specials to affect the positioning of the opponents with moves like Squiggly's center stage. It would be a hard thing to do, certainly, but if you did it well, it could ultimately result in a very, very fresh take on the genre. What is up? Uh, we are here to talk about some of our favorite stages. Um, and I want to say that one of my favorite stages, probably my favorite stage of all time, is Capcom versus SNK2 London. The London stage, just because, I mean, there's a few things that's really cool. You got some cameos, like character cameos in the background, right? Which is uh, really nice. Um, right? We have what? Who do we have? We have like Elena in like you know like casual wear you know which is really nice because normally you see her like in her like kind of her default costume with just like you know it's like pretty much she's almost naked but i like i always love casual wear clothing um and then there's some other characters in there i know there's a uh, billy kane there's also lily kane as well too and i had to look this up i didn't know he was talking to uh carmen cole carmen cole is is like he's from art of fighting um, so that was really surprising that, you know, I didn't, I couldn't recognize him at first, right? I didn't know who he was. Um, but then, um, as you play through the rounds and everything, like round two or like the, the second character, third character, it turns to like a, um, a different vibe, like a nighttime-ish, sort of-ish. And you also see like Rogue, um, from Power Stone and Rose together. It's like they're best friends or something, like BFFs or something like that. So I thought that was really cool. But the reason why I also really love the stage is the true love making um this stage has the music for true love making and i mean it's probably one of the most iconic songs um in fighting games so just the stage and how it works and the vibe even if you look at the cafe in the background it says cvs as like the cafe so obviously it means capcom versus snk um and you know there's like other transitions where like the you know you have like that red bus that walks by and it also keeps going in the background as well too as it like just goes off so yeah i would say for me that's like probably some of my like probably my favorite stage um and there's just so much man i just love cameos i mean shout outs to even alpha 2 at the final fight stage you just see like a bunch of the final fight characters like andor cody um you have even abigail really like late in the background so it's, it's like a, a bunch of really cool stages in fighting games but yeah we're gonna go with london cvs2 because all these different cameos and true love making what's up everyone kim the river over here First of all, I want to give a huge shout out to Babe Ruthless for inviting me to be part of this amazing project, which is talking about our favorite fighting game stages. In my case, I have been playing fighting games for a very long time, over 20 years now, and many of my favorite stages during time, that time have been from both games uh, that I played around that time when I started, or even games that uh, from were from way before I started playing fighting games. But interestingly, I decided on a stage that it's fairly more recent, which is Howard State from Tekken 7. As many people know, Geese Howard is my favorite fighting character of all time. No questions asked for different reasons, lore reasons, gameplay reasons, style reasons, too many, like, too many to know. And if you follow the character and you know his, uh, for example, his stages in the arena of Final Fury games, uh, you know there's some elements that even though the stages are different there are some elements that repeat in a couple of those three of those or even all of those and the thing is that even in modern versions of that stage you can see those like for example in kf uh, 14 but seeing a different company like bandai Namco take that and treat it with so much respect and upgrade it to a new generation and make it uh, kind of like an, a living stage because in Tekken 7 stages also have different types of interactions and there's different there's specific interactions in Giza's stage that are so 
accurate with how it should be. Like, uh, Giz has this uh, special intro where there's sliding doors opening before you get to him. You can even see that on the trailer. And seeing that become part of the stage and then uh, in, then have a whole courtyard with, filled with sakura trees, it's so on brand with what will Giz do. So there's too many things to like that show that people that did this did were like they probably like the character from before so I, you can see that for them it was a huge opportunity even the music it's is one of the best uh it, it quickly it immediately came one of my top two versions of uh of Soyuz for keys along with probably uh but uh of maximum impact version. so for all these reasons, I feel like it's such a good conversion, not just of the character, but also of his his place, that it's my favorite stage. Nostalgia is being bred deeper and deeper into the DNA of fighting games with each new generation. From returning characters making a comeback as DLC, to retro costumes that probably shouldn't cost so much, to classic stages making a return. As the host of this lovely channel has shown through much of her content, it can be a lot of fun to see an old arena revisited generations later, updated with fresh details thanks to advancements in technology, or an extra dimension that fundamentally changes the layout and playstyle of the stage, a new perspective as we fight in a different part of the location, or even a collage. Dead or Alive 6's Unforgettable is a very unique take on the retro throwback stage. This stage serves as a nice trip down memory lane, taking bits and pieces from several popular stages, representing every prior main entry in the series, and putting them together into an in-universe museum attraction dedicated to the history of the DOA tournament. We start with the circular hallway from DOA 3's Doatech HK stage. This leads to recreations of both Taylor's Bar and Hot Zone from DOA 5, complete with the latter's tank stage hazard. You can also knock the opponent down the stairs from DOA 4's Eternal Helix, dropping you off next to the same game's Gambler's Paradise, although without the moving cars and Halo Warthog this time. We also have DOA 2's final boss stage, Sacred Miyama, and even the Danger Zone from DOA 1 for some classic explosive floor action. And it's not just the locales that tug at the nostalgia centres of your brain. The hallways are also decorated with photos of iconic moments from the series. Like Zack being fired out of a cannon, or that time Lei Fang was accidentally groped on a train. N no, 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 the other time. The soundtrack includes music from some of these iconic stages when you enter that part of the arena. The transition isn't exactly seamless, but it is fun. Unforgettable is a stage concept that likely could not exist in a traditional 2D fighter, save for the multi-tiered stages of Injustice and a few others. And with the interactable components of those stages preserved here, it's not just the return of an aesthetic in a stage that is fundamentally the same as every other one in the game. It's the return of a full gameplay experience through which we're able to relive old memories from several iconic stages in one game, without it feeling obnoxious or like the developers have just completely run out of ideas. It's a truly fresh take on the retro stage idea that no other fighting game series has really come close to. The stage offers a uniquely memorable experience so that it, like the stages it draws on, truly is unforgettable. God, I'm a pretentious twat. <laughs> so, I've accidentally worked on a number of fighting games over the past 10 years in both production and marketing. I pretended that I have a better chance of advancing my career if I um, did a lot of research. Uh, throughout that time, I ran across a lot of levels, many of which I love for many very different reasons. Broken Laboratory and Super Street Fighter 4 felt like a true ultimate destruction of Sin's downfall. The Emerald Club variant in Diesel Legacy uses color reflections that patter on the 2D sprites. Japan and uh, Exert has this luscious backstory, which is essentially just a huge gaping waterfall where Japan used to be. Hell, even using the volcano stage in Street Fighter 4 was great because if I couldn't beat my opponent, I could blind him for as long as the match lasted. But ultimately, the answer came naturally to me. And my answer is Tiger's Lair, otherwise known as Jago Stage, in the 2013 Killer Instinct remake. It'll always be the one that makes the biggest impression on me, and still amazing to this day. Uh, Double Helix's final game before being acquired by Amazon helped pioneer some of the most remarkable aesthetic features to keep the octane action high, some of which is still partially used to this day, just like in Street Fighter VI. 
So what I'm talking about is the dynamic levels and music, which works hand in hand with each other. As the fight continues and big combos are performed, the stage transitions further and further until a winner is decided. Something's happened, like a gargantuan tornado appears, lightning hits a dam and it falls apart, some stupid flying thing from Halo has its pilot crash into a wall. All cool stuff that just that happens out of nowhere. In further updates to the game, they also added stage ultras, ways to kill your opponent using the stage. Uh, but none of this compares to the absolute insanity and level detail given to Tiger's Lair, the first of many that Double Helix presented to Microsoft. When the fight began, you were in this very arduous, hard to reach place, uh, looking monk dojo, an isolated human, uh, created sculpture that seemed to worship tigers on top of a mountain of some sort. Complete with bridge and enormous bell in the center of the stage, it was the perfect subset of just what you would expect for a first stage to look like. Now Mick Gordon, who's known for making a legendary soundtrack as well as the remake for Doom's OST, also had this beautiful blend of guitar, monk chants, female vocals, and a very catchy om type meditation rhythm. As the fight continued, pieces of the dojo would start falling apart, the faces, the pillars, and even the foundations start breaking off, giving you this sort of kung fu action flick feel that you're in charge of. Uh, the music is also getting way more intense based on the strength of the combos or for transitioning between rounds and so on and so forth. Uh, when we get to the end of the fight, the final big hit, that huge ass bell in the background, the foundation above it crumbles and shockingly, the entire thing completely drops off, wrecking the bridge and slowly tumbling down the mountain, revealing the full sprawling mountainside. Well, Mick Gordon himself is going fucking crazy with whatever ear magic he's creating. So, to me, experiencing all this, especially as a young QA tester idiot, was simply mind blowing. It changed my perception of how the important uh, presentation. Uh, was uh, how important the presentation was in every aspect of game creation and sometimes you can spruce up in places you never expected so the subversion of the expected happened in every possible instance here and that's always forever going to live with me hey hey it's me it's the guy matt mcmuscles and babe ruthless has posed the question what are some of our favorite fighting game stages and i decided to focus on the ones that give off the best vibes the ones that just have that unexplainable appeal which i'll now attempt to explain Garou Mark of the Wolves is arguably one of SNK's finest efforts, often being compared to Third Strike and other luminaries of the genre, and while its gameplay is emblematic of that, I wanted to give a shout out to its arenas and one in particular. SNK was the master of stage intros, ranging from various KOFs, Fatal Furies, and Kazuna Encounter, but Wolves basically perfected them. You have two to three establishing shots before each bout that smartly reuses some sprites or zooms in on certain elements of the stage and often ends with your next opponent posing menacingly. These do so much to complement each arena and help set the tone for the fight, and while all the stages are appealing and impressive in their own right, a massive waterfall, a crash pirate ship, and a traffic jam caused by ninja hijinks, it's Rock Howard stage Live House Old Line that I love the most. The quick but effective shots of a jamming nightclub, the cars taxiing, the muffled dance music, and that last image of Rock adjusting his gloves is the essence of 90s SNK swagger. The fight takes place in a parking lot right outside the nightclub, which is pretty standard in terms of common fighting game arenas, but really it's the little things that stand out here. The accurate sense of scale and proper perspective of the buildings, the attractive use of color on the stonework, the dusky night sky, the giant mural on the left, and the line of old people, line of old people, <laughs> and the line of people in the back bobbing their heads, everything just looks so on point. Not to mention, these are some of the most glorious and slickest looking cars you'll ever see via the magic that is pixel art. The stage is also not too busy or distracting, nor too empty and lifeless like, say, uh, a lot of KOF 11 environments. Again, striking that balance of feeling like a real place while still maintaining those effortlessly cool Southtown vibes. Or a second South vibes, more accurately. I would be remiss if I also didn't mention the fantastic track that plays here, Spread the Wings, which, yes, samples Robert Miles' track, Children. I probably saved you about half a dozen comments right there. 
While SNK has made some of the most iconic and gorgeous backgrounds in the history of 2D fighters, uh, several in Sam Show or KOF are more impressive from a graphical standpoint, I think the slightly more subtle and cool feel of Garo deserves special recognition. Because for here, the mighty rule. Hello and welcome, this is Roofmonger, and my friends, I've been asked to pick one of my favorite fighting game stages of all time. And I got a lot of favorite fighting game stages, but for this specific video, I want to showcase one that might not get as much love as some others, and specifically one that sort of, well, frankly, hated. And I am talking about Skies of Honor. So Skies of Honor, I think, is truly a beautiful stage with a fantastic concept. Your two characters are fighting on a plane, like while the plane's going around a city, right? And the issue why some people may not like it is, frankly, motion sickness. Now, myself, I don't suffer from that. And for everyone that does, my condolences, I suppose. But since I don't, I appreciate this stage for what it is and such an amazing and cool concept. Also for myself, as a Vega player in Street Fighter V, the whole idea of fighting on the plane, when you uh, combine that with things like Vega's wall dives, it really starts raising the question, what exactly is he wall diving off of? On a more grounded stage, your brain can trick itself and like, well, there's the wall. Maybe the wall you can't see or anything like that, but there's the wall. But here, a wall dive would entail him jumping off the plane wing and falling to his death, which... <laughs> It's just funny to think about, I suppose. The presentation of the stage is great. The music is great. The Skies of Honor is one of my favorite tracks in all of Street Fighter V, and Street Fighter V has a fantastic soundtrack. And just shots like this, as we're kind of going between the two big buildings, right? And while, you know, you're punching and kicking each other and doing your combos and all that kind of stuff, uh, just this shot here specifically, I think is a fantastic visual. So Skies of Honor is a reviled stage to some, especially for those, you know, it may cause motion sickness in. But, you know, for everyone else, at least for me, uh, since I don't have that specific problem, I've always loved the music, I love the visuals, I love the concept, I love the everything about this stage. So maybe not a standard pick, but I think Skies of Honor is straight up one of the coolest stages in fighting game history. Fighting game stages weren't something that I thought a lot of people paid a lot of attention to. And then I watched Babe Ruthless's videos and realized that there's at least one person who does. So, when she asked me to do a minute on one of my favorite stages in fighting games, it didn't take too long for me to come up with an answer. The bad ones. You see, stages are weird because the worse they look, the more they stick out. But the better they look, the more they fade into the, uh, background. So when games try to spice things up a bit, they can sometimes go too far in the wrong direction. Specifically, I love some of the band stages from Street Fighter V because they are, scientifically speaking, very funny. Kanzuki Beach is one of my favorite examples of a bad fighting game stage because it's brave enough to ask the question, can you play footsies if you can't see the foots? I love this stage so much because it's one of the few fighting game stages in the history of the genre where being in the corner is actually kind of an advantage because you can actually see your whole character model. And uh, speaking of the corner, I've been walking right on the field of fate and I'm still not sure that I've found the corner yet. And lastly, as someone who cut their teeth on Street Fighter 2 and was jealous as hell that Vega could climb the wall like the giant a-hole that he is, getting the opportunity to finally do that myself three games later was a catharsis that I didn't know that I wanted. But I did have to play Vega, and I don't play charge characters, and it turns out that the move kind of sucks, so I didn't do that. Anyway, next. Yo, what's good? You know, it's a beautiful day out today for some reason. But I ain't here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about this young, uh, one of the greatest stages I've ever seen in a fighting game ever. Now, this is for my OGs, okay? For my OGs. Y'all remember Power Stone 2? Y'all remember that? That airship level on Power Stone 2 is probably one of the greatest stages I've ever seen in a fighting game ever. Let me tell you something right now. Anything that you do on an airship is already crazy. You know what I'm talking about? 
Like you're fighting on the airship, whatever. Like you're doing, you're dancing on the airship, whatever you're doing on the airship. It's already crazy. Come, no matter if it's fighting games, Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever it is. If you're on the airship, it's already crazy. So we wreck it on the airship, right? We wreck it. We fight. It's all good. I'm cooking. Then out of nowhere, when I'm cooking, the 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 damn airship just it blows up or something like so, something happens to the airship and we got to jump off the airship we jump off the airship and then guess what happens we got a wreck in the air while we're skydiving we're literally free falling and we got to like fight in the air in the sky the dude the announcer even goes the sky is falling no these hands is falling that's what's falling so i'm about to i'm about to drop bombs on these dudes in the air so next thing you know we're fighting it's randomly an umbrella right it's like two they usually drop like two umbrellas I don't know how an umbrella is going to stop you from, you know, busting your head on the canvas, but it is what it is. We ain't talking about fake stuff. We're talking about the real stuff. So then after that, you get your umbrella and some cake falling too. You get some sustenance. So the cake is falling. Then you get to the main area. Then you wreck it on the main area. If you don't have an umbrella, you bust your head all over the concrete. You lose a little bit of health. Okay. I don't know how you only lose a little bit, not half, but you lose a little bit of health. Then after that, then after that, it's a it's a little water, like it's like a waterfall or something like that. I always tell my goons to meet me at the waterfall. You know, if it's a part of the level, you know, you go meet up top of the stairs where the boulders are. No, I don't want to fight by the boulders. You fight by the waterfall. It's beautiful. It's majestic. It's just, it's just, I can't even put it into words. It's one of the greatest stages I've ever seen in a whole fighting game ever. If you never played Power Stone 2, go play it. Look at the stage. I don't even know the name of it to this day because even in the game, they don't even tell you the name. They just show you the stage and you're like, okay, the airplane, the airship, that is the greatest stage I've ever seen in a fight game, just to let y'all know. All right, man, it's K-Brad, later. I know there's two sets of fighting games, games with goated stages and games that I don't remember, probably. Power for the Grid was a cool game, but the stages were so bland that it gave me some object permanence issues. The problem with that is that if you would ask me to narrow it down to my favorite fighting game stage specifically, the question inevitably morphs into a task of quantum mechanics. The state of my favorite stage changes depending on when it's observed. I'm keen on like 90% of the Blaze Blue stages until I'm just suddenly not. Most people hate the train in Exard, but sometimes the widely held assumption is the incorrect answer. And considering Daisuke didn't let you go to a training room, so you flip-flop between the worst two stages means I can't trust the majority consensus. I'm inconsistent in what my favorite stage is, indecisive as the man-child that I am. So consider that what I'm about to say is a snapshot of my current opinion that's destined to change. With some of my favorite games being a little bit artsy and out there, you'd be right in assuming that I like my stages pretentious, nuanced, and removed from surface level enjoyment. Anyway, let's talk about dinosaurs. Even if late 2000s, early 2010s Capcom was debatably in its flop era, it was pulling a fit off with its arenas. Ultra 4 stages give me the same warm fuzzies that Halo 3 Guardian gives to modern incels. And to me, the Jurassic era research facility has a quality that embodies everything about this weird time period perfectly. Now I know it's originally from Street Fighter X Tekken, but I don't know how to play this game and I'm not trying to get judged for my Heihachi. My SFXT gameplay sucks, I get it, you're much better than me, even though you've never played it, but you watch enough Theory Fighter videos to know that it was your favorite game of all time. While Ultra 4 might be missing the upper balcony that matches Star On and a cameo from Alex, that doesn't mean that the stage is any less vibrant in its completely unambiguous fun. Not to mention its completely unambiguous inspiration, but I mean, there's been a lot of dinosaur franchises, it, you know, who's to really say what it's based on? Attempting to ignore Tyrantrum in the back, I'm really keen on the vibrant colors in this stage. Lush greens dominate the space against scarce man-made silvers that make the stage poppy without being too visually loud. If there's one quality that I'd describe all of Ultra 4 stages as having, it would be vibrant. If it's not in the colors, then it's in the background characters and the amount of things happening on screen. Our star of the show here being the dinosaurs themselves. If they were just floating around, that'd be fine. They'd give the stage a theme by itself, but how they shuffle and wince with the fighters as they're going at it makes them come across as goofy. Maybe if you're insistent on keeping true to the source material, that'd be a bad thing, but for a stage that's just a fun knockoff of Jurassic Park, I want my big lumbering death lizard to come across more like a dumpy skyscraper sized plush toy. The situation is already absurd and stupid, just like lean into it, and that's what they did here. 
And I like that. It makes me smile. It makes me do a big smile. Any stage that win or lose is able to spark a neuron activation inside of my rotten brain is deserving, at the very least, of my own personal Hall of Fame. Vampire Saver, also known as Doc Sockers 3, has a plethora of eye-catching stages. There's Dimitri's throne room, a forest full of carnivorous plants, the one with the giant demonic fetus, a torture room, giant fetus, an abandoned city. Did I mention the giant demonic fetus? But my absolute favorite stage is the Tower of Arrogance. Even though VSAP is such a visually striking game, this stage always stuck out to me for some reason. At first glance, it just looks like you're fighting in some weird tunnel with a bunch of lights, which doesn't quite fit the horror monster theme that Darkstalkers is known for. But then you take a closer look. What are those moving lights in the background? Is that a helicopter? Wait, is that a roof? And then it hits you. You're not in a weird space elevator at all. You're actually fighting on the side of a building. Those moving lights down there? Those are the traffic lights from cars driving along a street. It's such a cool optical illusion that tends to sneak by folks, even veterans of the game, and the inclusion of the helicopter watching the fight in the background fleshes out the world of Darkstalkers quite well. I like to imagine that it's a news chopper reporting live on this bizarre side of a cat girl fighting a rocker zombie. These are just a couple of reasons why I'm particularly fond of Tower of Arrogance, as well as the world of Darkstalkers in general. Anyway, about that fetus. Okay, so for me this took way longer than I thought it would because I'm kind of constantly flip-flopping between which game I think has the best stages. But since we gotta narrow it down to just a single stage, I was first initially stuck between three main ones. Tekken 4 overall means so much to me, and the top of the building with the song Authentic Sky is mesmerizing. And Pocket Fighter is another game that I grew up with. Tessa's Den had just such a cozy atmosphere and is what fighting games in general are to me. But if we're only picking one, it's this stage. Capcom vs SNK 1 is probably one of, if not my favorite fighting game. The aesthetics of all the stages and music are a huge part as to why, and there's like four stages in here that are in my top 10 favorites, but Akuma stage was one I truly felt I earned since you have to unlock everything in the game first and actually be good enough to fight Akuma in arcade mode. As a young kid, this was such an accomplishment to me, and I didn't even know this stage existed until I faced Akuma himself. It's so beautiful, with your characters just standing on some shallow water with a basin in the background. The ruins of a long-forgotten Japanese temple and Raijin and Fujin statues crumbling with time are a common Akuma stage motif, but to me, this is the best version of it. The secluded nature of the stage is just pure distilled fighting game essence. Where else is the perfect spot to have a one-on-one -on -one battle? The song too just nails that energy, that not only are you giving it all you got, but your opponent is too. For an Akuma stage, this song doesn't have any hint of sinisterness, which just makes it more special to me that good and evil are being put aside, and it's just the fight. Thank you guys so much for not only watching this video, but also all the rest of my other videos. Uh, really means a lot to me because we just hit 10k subscribers and honestly I'm still just trying to wrap my head around that because I remember when a hundred people subscribed to my channel and I just literally could not believe that a hundred people would click that subscribe button on my goofy ass videos so I just want to thank you guys for watching so much and giving me a platform for my incoherent rambling. Um, secondly, I also just again want to give another really big thank you to all the people who have participated in this video. You guys are hugely inspirational to me and actually a large part of why this channel even exists because for a really long time I was actually just a spectator in the community. And honestly, I was just like, I was too scared to go to locals or join a tournament or honestly even play online. But thankfully I can say that that has all changed now. And it's really thanks to you guys who have been so supportive and have just like really changed my life in more ways than you might realize. <laughs>